Let's revise the whole of AQA engineering physics, starting up with the moment of inertia. So this measures the resistance to rotation and it's pretty similar to mass in non-rotational physics. For a single particle, the moment of inertia is defined as the mass multiplied by the radius of rotation squared. So let's just say that we have uh, some sort of a mass that is being rotated in a circle. So we just place the mass on the edge of the circle. So let's say we have a mass m over here. And uh, let's say it's rotating around this point. The moment of inertia will be mr squared. Now, if we have more than one particle, because realistically, if we have something like, I don't know, a sphere, this will consist of a lot of different individual particles. In fact, it will probably be just a continuum of particles. So what we need to do then is we need to sum up all of the individual moments of inertia. And if that's the case, the formula just becomes the sum of m r squared. So in practice, it is not really practical to always be thinking about summing up all the individual moments of inertia. For instance, if you have uh, a solid sphere, using some integration, we can derive that the moment of inertia of a solid sphere is equal to 2 fifths m r squared. If we had a, if we have a solid, or sorry, excuse me, if we have a hollow sphere, the moment of inertia is two thirds m r squared. All of these formulae you don't need to remember for the exam; they will always be given. But it's useful to know uh, more or less where they come from. If we had a solid wheel, the moment of inertia is just equal to a half m multiplied by r squared. Now, if uh, there's one more which can appear, and that is the uh, essentially like a hollow wheel, should we just call it a hollow ring? And um, if that's the case, the moment of inertia of this is just equal to m r squared. But once again, these will always be given in the question. So let's do an example. Imagine that we have, let's say, a bike tire like this and let's say that the bike tire has a weight of 500 grams or let's just say around half a kilo. I think they're a little bit lighter in real life but uh, we're just trying to show how this equation works and let's say that it is 40 centimeters um, in radius. What is the moment of inertia of this body? Well I is just equal to m r squared for a hollow ring and remember something like a bike tire uh, is actually uh, hollow while it has some air on the inside okay well in this case this would just be equal to 0.5 multiplied by r squared which is 40 times 10 to the power of minus 2 o squared and uh, this will give us 0 0.08 kilograms meter squared now, very often we have to combine the moment of inertia. Let's say that we add a little mass, it could be a bike reflector to the wheel or something like that, and let's say that this has a mass of 0.1 kg, so, or 100 grams. The total moment of inertia, if that's the case, will then be, let's call it I total, will just be the moment of inertia of the actual ring or the wheel, which is 0.08 kilograms meter squared, plus the moment of inertia of this reflector, which we're treating typically as a point mass, uh, if the question says so, of course, uh, so it'll be plus mr squared, so the mass is 0.1 kg, and this is 20 centimeters away, uh, so it's going to be 0.2 meters squared meaning that the total moment of inertia will then be equal to 0 0.084 kilograms meter squared. Now, in some other questions, we may, we may be given, let's say, two wheels or a different shape that's uh, somehow attached. And if that's the case, we're going to be using a one of those formulas that are here on the left. Now let's revise rotational kinetic energy. 
First of all, linear kinetic energy. So let's just say linear Ke is just given by the standard formula of a half mv squared. As we said, the moment of inertia plays exactly the same role as the standard mass in linear mechanics. So in rotational mechanics, this equation for the kinetic energy, shall we just go with Ke rather than linear Ke or Ek, um, would just be equal to a half times the moment of inertia and rather than the speed we're going to have the angular speed squared now what exactly is the angular speed um, this is equal to the angular displacement so i can write this like that delta theta divided by delta t this equation over here for the angular displacement, this is not given in the exam, we need to remember it, and this is measured in typically in radians per second, because the SI unit for angular displacement is radians, and um, the SI unit for time, of course, is uh, the second. So let's apply this to an example. We have a solid sphere of mass 1 kg is rotating at 2 radians per second. The radius of the sphere is 20 centimeters. Its mass is 1 kg. And all we need to do is find the rotational kinetic energy. As I said, we'll be given the formula for the moment of inertia. But the kinetic energy uh, will just be equal to a half. So let's just write this properly. So that will be a half times i, which is the moment of inertia, times the angular speed squared. So this will be equal to a half times. The moment of inertia is given here, so it'll be 2 fifths, so 2 over 5, multiplied by the uh, mass, which is 1 kg, so times 1 times r squared, which is just 20 centimeters, so it's going to be 0.2. 0 squared multiplied by the angular speed squared, so it's going to be 2 squared. When we put this into a calculator, we are going to get approximately 0 0.032 joules. Just a little note about rotational physics. As we said, this here is angular velocity. So this is the equivalent of speed in rotational physics. This angle here, theta, this is the equivalent or angular displacement is the equivalent of normal displacement in linear physics. Omega, the angular speed, is the equivalent of, well, the speed. And we can also define angular acceleration, which typically is given the symbol alpha. And this is just uh, delta w, or delta omega, excuse me, divided by delta t. So it is the rate of change of angular speed. So alpha here is the equivalent of normal acceleration. We can actually rewrite our favorite Suvat equations using those terms. For instance, uh, let's show, just do one of them for revision. If we have V is equal to U plus AT in linear physics, we could define that in rotational physics as final speed, so should we call it omega final, will be equal to omega initial, so we'll call it omega i, plus alpha, which is the angular acceleration, multiplied by the time that's elapsed. I mean, we could also take this a step further. For instance, in normal linear physics, if we have a graph of, let's say, the displacement against time, we know that the gradient of that graph is the speed. So the gradient here is the, uh, is the speed. Well, if we have a graph of, let's say, angular displacement, theta, against 
time, then the gradient, this is typically typically non-linear, but should we just draw it linear in this case? Otherwise, we'll have to draw the tangent. But the gradient of this graph will be equal to angular velocity. And in exactly the same way, if we had a graph of, let's say, omega against time, which is the angular speed against time, let's say this could be a linear or nonlinear graph, but the gradient of this graph will just be equal to angular acceleration. So let's talk about forces. The turning effect of a force or the net turning moment of a force is really known as a torque where F is the force applied and R is just the perpendicular distance to the axis of rotation. So in normal dynamics, the main dynamics equation that we solve is just Newton's second law, which is F is equal to ma. Well, torque plays a similar role in rotational mechanics. The main equation that we tend to solve dynamical problems with is that the torque is equal to the moment of inertia I, which is the equivalent of mass, multiplied by the angular acceleration. I mean, we can also relate this to something like work done, for instance. So classically, work done is just equal to force times distance. And uh, in rotational physics, the work done will be equal to the torque multiplied by the angular displacement. Additionally, as well, the power in uh, non-rotational physics is just force times velocity. So in this case, it will be equal to the torque multiplied by angular velocity, where once again, the torque plays the effect of the force and omega or angular speed is the equivalent of linear speed. So let's talk about flywheels next. So a flywheel is essentially a wheel with a pretty high moment of inertia. The way we get that is with high mass. We can also get that with a larger radius, but typically we're prioritizing the higher mass. The idea behind it is to resist changes to its rotation. It will store rotational energy and just enough power is actually transferred to the wheel to, overcame, to overcome the frictional torque. Now, if power is needed to the rest of the machine, then the flywheel will actually be spinning um, not as fast and will transfer some of its power away. Now, what are the factors that affect energy storage? Remember, the rotational kinetic energy is equal to a half times the moment of inertia multiplied by omega squared. So I depends on the mass and the radius. So the mass is a factor which uh, is very important. The higher the mass, the higher the amount of stored energy. Additionally, if we make the flying wheel spin faster or it will or it having a higher have a higher rotational speed omega, uh, this would also mean that the energy will go up. Let's just say that those things lead to the energy going up. Now, actually, it which is something which is very, very interesting for uh, slightly different reasons. But if we add some spokes, then the amount of stored energy will also be higher. So flywheels are extensively used in machines. For instance, they're used in engines, wind turbines, electricity grids, uh, regenerative braking, cars and many others. They have quite a few advantages. For instance, they have a relative high efficiency. They can be recharged pretty quickly. All we need to do is to apply a force and spin them. And they are pretty environmentally friendly. Obviously, there are, there are some disadvantages. The number one is that they're very large and they're very, very heavy. Uh, they pose a safety risk because they can reach their breaking point And uh, we definitely don't want something big that is spinning to break apart. In practice, this uh, increases the mass even further because there has to be some sort of a protective casing around it. 
Now, in linear physics, remember our momentum, P, is given by the product of mass times velocity. In rotational physics, we have angular momentum, which is really important, and uh, this is just given by the moment of inertia times the angular velocity. We can also have a uh, angular impulse, but remember, in normal uh, non-rotational physics, our impulse is equal to the amount of force, or the average force, multiplied by some amount of time, delta t. We can also have a uh, angular impulse, which um, is just given by the torque multiply by delta t. Now, similar to Newton's second law, this presumes that t is actually a constant. If it's not a constant, the formula for angular impulse is simply delta, or the change in i, the, um, the moment of inertia, multiplied by the angular velocity, and we use that when t, um, our torque, is not constant. So let's explain the first law of thermodynamics. The equation for it is Q is equal to delta U plus W. In this case, Q is the energy transfer, delta U is the change in internal energy, and W is the work done by the system. Now, what does this equation actually mean? Imagine that we have a little gas over here, which is confined into a cylinder, and there's a little piston over here. So let's imagine that there are some particles um, over here. If we were to heat this gas up, so if the temperature rises, the only way to do that would be to transfer some energy into the system. So in this example, we could heat the system up by inputting, let's say, 100 joules of energy. Now, quite a large percentage of this um, energy will actually go into increasing the internal energy of the gas. This simply means that all of those uh, kinetic, uh, all of those molecules will have a higher kinetic energy. So let's just make up some numbers over here. So let's just say that the change of energy is equal to 80 joules. Now, this will allow us to calculate the work done by the system. So in this case, the amount of work done will just simply be equal to 20 joules. So what is an adiabatic process? In an adiabatic process, there is no net gain or loss of heat. In other words, delta Q or Q is equal to zero. This has quite a few consequences in terms of the first law, because uh, as we know, Q is equal to de delta U, which is just our change in internal energy, plus W. If Q is equal to zero, then delta U plus W will be equal to zero, meaning that delta U will actually be equal to minus W. So this means that any change in the internal energy of the system will be caused by work done. So if work is done by the system, the convention is that W is actually positive. Now, if this guy is positive, this means that delta U, the internal energy, will be decreasing because delta U is going to be equal to a negative number. Let's say, I don't know, 100 joules, etc. So it would be minus W. Now, if work is done on the system, then W is negative. So we actually are getting a double negative. You can kind of think of it this way, meaning that the internal energy of the system will be increasing rather than decreasing. For example, if we have this piston, which will, we could compress adiabatically, um, this would mean that we're doing work on the system. If we're doing work on the system, those molecules here are going to be moving at higher speed as the piston is going down, the temperature will be increasing. And you can actually notice that every time you are 
pumping up, for instance, your bicycle tires, you're going to notice that the temperature is increasing because the internal energy is increasing and all you're doing really is you're doing some work on the system. Now the mathematics behind it is uh, actually governed by the following equation, so P multiplied by V and V is now raised to a factor which is um, known as a gamma factor and uh, this whole quantity is a constant. So this um, gamma is known as the adiabatic constant. So let's just spell that adiabatic constant. And uh, typically for, uh, for a gas, most of the time uh, you're going to notice that gamma is actually equal to 5 over 3. So now let's have a look at isothermal processes. Well, they happen at constant temperature. Let's apply the first law of thermodynamics yet again. So Q is equal to delta U plus W. Constant temperature actually means no change in the internal energy of the gas. So delta U will actually be equal to zero, meaning that Q will be equal to zero plus W, meaning that Q will be equal to the work done. Just to recap from thermal physics as well, if they happen at a constant temperature, we can also say that because PV is equal to uh, NRT, the ideal gas law equation, if the temperature is constant, this whole right hand side here is a constant, so we can say that PV is equal to a constant, or that P1V1 is equal to P2V2. Let's have a look at work done at constant pressure next. So the equation for work done is actually that W is equal to P times delta V. Where does this equation actually come from? So work done is defined normally as force multiplied by the distance. So imagine we have some piston which um, is moving up at a constant pressure and let's say that it's moved a distance h from its starting position. So in this case the work done will be force multiplied by h. However, remember pressure is defined as force of the area, meaning that the force is equal to p times a, where just a will be the uh, cross-sectional area in this case. So in this case w will be equal to P A multiplied by H. But think about it, A times H, this will be the volume. In this case, this will be a cylindrical volume or the change in volume from the starting position. Meaning that the work done will be equal to P times delta V. Now, this equation only uh, is only valid at a constant pressure, and I would like to emphasize this. Now something really ha interesting happens at constant volume. The actual work done at constant volume, as you can probably guess, is actually zero because W is equal to P delta V, and if the volume doesn't change, well, the work done is equal to zero. If the work done is equal to zero, we can once again apply the first law of thermodynamics that Q is equal to delta U plus W and if the work done is equal to zero then we can say that all of the heat has gone into raising the internal energy of the gas, the, the actual kinetic energy of the molecules. At a constant volume, we could also apply this to PV is equal to NRT, meaning that at a constant um, volume, P over T will be NR over V. So all of this will be a constant on the right-hand side, meaning that P1 over T1 will be equal to P2 over V2. Just for consistency in our approach, we also apply this for the case at constant pressure. So let's apply PV is equal to NRT over here as well. So if PV is equal to NRT, if the pressure is constant, then 
V over T will be equal to NR divided by P. N is just the, um, N is just the amount of substance. Assuming that it's a closed system, this will be a constant. R is the gas constant and P is also a constant, meaning that V over T is equal to a constant. And this, of course, means that V1 over T1 is equal to V2 over T2. So let's have a look at PV diagrams. Now we're going to start off with isotherms, which are the graphs of isothermic processes which happen at constant temperature. They actually look like this. The gradient is not super steep like this. If we've forgotten the shape, how can we remember it? Remember, PV is equal to NRT. And because they happen at a constant temperature, P is going to equal to some constant because NRT is just a constant divided by the volume. So this is kind of similar to Y is equal to 1 over X or constant over X. Now, if the temperature is um, a little bit higher, the graph will look like this. So it'll be just a shift it a little bit upwards like so, and this is higher temperature. If the temperature, on the other hand, is lower, then the graph will be just underneath over here, and this is lower temperature. Now, a very typical question would actually look at the area underneath the graph. So let me, let's just focus on this first curve over here. And if we're interested in the work done between, let's say, V1 and V2, then we can calculate that using the area underneath the graph. Remember, the work done is equal to P delta V, meaning that the work done is equal to the area under a PV graph. We could also plot adiabatic curves. So remember, Q is equal to zero within an adiabatic process. And an adiabatic expansion will look like this. It is very similar to the isotherm. However, I would say that it has a steeper gradient. So let's just say that the curve is steeper. A adiabatic compression, on the other hand, will look like this, where this arrow is just indicating that the volume is decreasing, and this arrow here is indicating that the volume is indeed increasing. Now, we can also have a look at the graphs for some slightly simpler cases. For instance, if we have a look at a constant pressure graph. So should we just write over here that if the pressure is constant, the graph will look like a straight line. So the PV graph in this case will just be a straight line. That was a terrible straight line. Let's try again. So there we go, it's a bit more like it. At constant pressure, the well, the pressure doesn't change. And if we had a constant volume, so let's write this down over here. If we had a constant volume, well, the graph will be a straight line, but simply in the other direction because the volume never changes. Now we can combine all of these graphs into a cycle. For instance, we could start off with something like this. It could be, for instance, an isothermic expansion. And then let's say we have some constant pressure. So this is meant to be a straight line. And then maybe we have the reverse uh, or maybe an adiabatic compression. And finally, we have another um, compression at a constant pressure like so and um, if this happens we have a cycle. Now the work done will be equal to the area inside of the loop like so. So in order to work out the work done, so the work done will be equal to the area of the loop. 
Now let's revise one of my favorites, which is a four stroke engine. Now, first of all, what exactly is a four stroke engine? So in a way, this is just a engine that burns fuel. So we can just write then burns fuel once, and this is the keyword um, for every four strokes. So for every four strokes of the piston, of the piston. So before that, we had two stroke engines that were not environmentally friendly. And if some of you guys have ridden, for instance, bikes, so you might have had a two stroke bike. Uh, anyway, so let's go back to the first stroke, which is the induction. So this is a really, really important one. And the piston essentially starts at the top. So it starts somewhere over here and then starts going down. The volume of the gas directly above it starts to increase. And this process tends to happen at a constant pressure. It's represented by the PV diagram here on the right, and you can see that the pressure remains constant as the volume is increasing. Meanwhile, fuel and air mixture gets into the engine. Let's draw this a little bit better, and we can see that the inlet valve is open, and uh, some of this mixture is going into the engine. Meanwhile, the outlet valve is closed. So the piston goes down, and uh, after it goes down, the second stroke is known as the compression stroke. The inlet valve is now closed, as we can see, and the pressure starts to increase as the piston is now going up. Now, just before the end, right over here, the moment that I've captured in my diagram, a spark will occur and the pressure and the volume will increase very dramatically at that point. Now, let me just redraw this a little bit for the PV diagram. So um, initially, you, there's, there's a little bit of a compression, but this is actually a little bit more gentle. And then the moment the spark occurs, the rise in pressure is pretty dramatic. So right over here is the moment where the spark actually occurs. And this is the compression stroke. A spark will occur and the pressure and the volume will increase very dramatically at that point. Now, let me just redraw this a little bit for the PV diagram. So, um, Initially, you, there's, there's a little bit of a compression, but this is actually a little bit more gentle. And then the moment the spark occurs, the rise in pressure is pretty dramatic. So right over here is the moment where the spark actually occurs. And this is the compression stroke. Now the third stroke right over here is the expansion stroke. So air fuel mixture then expands because it's been heated up. Maybe we should draw it with a slightly different color. Let's add in a bit of orange over here. And um, there is uh, work done in this case. So there's work done on the piston by the gas and the work that is being done is more than the inputted energy, i.e. there is a net output of energy. Because this is um, an expansion stroke, this is represented in the PV diagram like so. So the third stroke is the expansion stroke. Air fuel mixture expands and does actually some work on the piston and um, the piston is actually expanding. And the important the important aspect is that the work it does is more than the work required to compress the gas, i.e. there's a net output of energy. We can represent this in the PV diagram as, uh, as follows. So remember, we started off at constant pressure. Let's just try and draw a straight line, a little bit more like that. Then we had some compression and there was a spark right over here. But now what we're going to get is some expansion, meaning that the volume will increase once again. 
and the final part of the uh, the of the cycle is the fourth stroke which is the exhaust stroke the piston moves up the cylinder and the burned air fuel mixture is actually leaving through the exhaust valve which is now open so we can draw the final bit uh, like so it happens more or less at a constant uh, pressure and uh, we can represent it with this line like so and our four stroke cycle is complete now let's compare them with diesel engines so they're also four strokes but they work quite differently first of all during the first stroke so maybe let's just number these so during the first stroke only air goes into the cylinder during that induction stroke during the compression stroke, the air is, is actually compressed at a high enough temperature and that ignites the diesel fuel, so there's no spark plugs. And before the end of the stroke, the fuel injector is actually injected, or the fuel injector injects some diesel fuel and that ignites simply due to the high temperature. The expansion and the exhaust strokes are very, very similar. The actual indicator diagram, those diagrams, by the way, are known as indicator diagrams, look uh, pretty similar. You can recognize it from the lack of a sharp peak and there's this little flat part right at the top of the graph. Now let's talk a little bit about power and efficiency. So we need to know the following terms for the exam. First of all, our indicated power, you can kind of think of it as the total power produced by the engine is um, equal to the area of the PV loop. So if we have a PV loop uh, in, a, in a diagram, uh, I don't know, this is, won't be part of a four-stroke engine, but let's just say the PV loop of this um, the area of the PV loop, multiply by the number of cycles per second, multiply by the number of cylinders will give us the indicated power. The friction power is equal to the indicated power take away the brake power. Now, what is the brake power? Um, this is essentially, you can kind of think of it as the amount of power that is lost due to friction. So all engines have lots of moving parts and this is an important one to keep as low as possible. Your mechanical efficiency is the ratio between the brake power and the indicated power and the thermal efficiency is equal to the indicated power divided by the input power. The overall efficiency on the other hand is defined as the brake power divided by the input power. So lots of ratios. Okay, now let's talk about efficiency. One of the most important things is that engines absolutely cannot work by using the first principle of thermodynamics only. The reason for that is because some of the heat will always be transferred to the engine and this will increase its temperature. If the temperature reaches that of the heat source or the temperature of the heat source, there's going to be no heat flowing and no work will be done. Now, luckily, we have the second law of thermodynamics. And uh, let's start off with, um, with a couple of bits of uh, labeling. So the heat from the heat source is Q. H, typically just written like that, Q subscript H. Some of this is converted to useful work, but some of it has to be transferred to a heat sink, meaning a region of lower temperature. Now, this consequence means that engines cannot be 100% efficient, and this really is the heart of the of our first understanding of the second law of thermodynamics with engineering in mind. The formula for this is that the efficiency is equal to the work done divided by QH and that will be equal to QH minus QC. Those differences in energies will actually be equal to the work done. This is simply a ratio.
On the other hand, the maximum theoretical efficiency will be equal to the difference in temperatures between the heat source, which is TH, and the temperature of the heat sink. In practice, this really is all the components uh, of, um, of the engine. And this is the maximum theoretical efficiency of an engine. And the very final topic that we'll need to discuss are reverse heat engines. So these are your fridges and heat pumps. The important thing is that the direction of energy transfer is very different. So heat naturally tends to flow from a cold place to a hot place. Sometimes you may hear that being called a reservoir in, uh, in thermal physics. So uh, to do the opposite, we need to do some work in order to extract heat from a cold place and bring that to a cold place. Well, this is exactly what refrigerators do and they can provide nice cold drinks on a hot summer's day. So anyways, that's not on the spec by the way, um, they remove as much heat as possible from a cold space, in this case this here is the cold space, per joule of work done and this is really important. Typically the cold space, well always the cold space is inside of the fridge and the hot space is actually the room it occupies. There are also heat pumps and a heat pumps the maximum possible heat per joule of work done and um, the uh, heat pump will, um, in the case of the heat pump, the cold space is usually the outside environment. So they tend to be used to heat up essentially homes, rooms, water for, for usage, etc. Now we can you, we can have a look at the equations for the efficiency of those which are known as the coefficient of performance. The equations are very very similar to the equations of an engine, however they have been flipped. So the coefficient of performance for a refrigerator, with a subscript R over here, is equal to QC over W. Maybe I should just uh, make some notes over here. But QC is the heat transferred from the cold place. So, um, so QC is the heat transferred from the cold place like so. Let's define QH as well, which is the heat transferred to the hot place. So that's the heat transferred to the hot place. And the maximum theoretical efficiency occurs, or uh, the expression for it for a refrigerator is given by uh, Tc over Th minus Tc, where those are the corresponding temperatures for the hot and the cold place. Now in the case of a heat pump, the equation is very similar, however we, we have Qh at the top, and um, this here is the equation for the maximum theoretical efficiency of a heat pump. Okay guys, well, we have revised the whole of engineering physics in AQA. I'm really hoping this very long video was useful. Thank you very much for watching and good luck in your revision.